Aliens exist and President Trump knows about it. That's according to Israel's former space security chief. In an interview with an Israeli newspaper, he said the aliens have been waiting until today for humanity to develop and reach a stage where we will understand in general what space and spaceships are. NBC News chief global correspondent Bill Neely explains this one. Hi, Alison. Well, this is quite a story, and it comes from the man who headed Israel's space security program for nearly 30 years. Chaim Eshed is making the extraordinary claim that the United States and Israel have been in contact with a group of aliens for years, not immigrants, but extraterrestrials. He has called them the Galactic Federation of Aliens, and he says President Trump is aware of the existence of these aliens and had been on the verge of revealing their secrets, he claims, but was asked not to do so by the Federation in order to prevent what he calls mass hysteria. Well, the retired general says the US and Israel have kept it from the public because Quotes, humanity isn't ready and the aliens don't want to reveal themselves until humanity can evolve, he says, and understand what space really is. Well, the good news is that he claims an agreement has been reached between the US government and the aliens, a contract to do experiments here. There's also, he says, a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. Now, this former head of a branch of Israel's defense ministry is 87. He was very well respected, at least until now. And he said all this in an interview with an Israeli newspaper in Hebrew, but it's really taken off after parts of it were published in English by the Jerusalem Post today. He says he's come forward now in the hope that his news will be accepted as true. He notes that if he'd made these claims five years ago, he would have been hospitalized. But now he says, I've got nothing to lose. Well, so far, President Trump has not tweeted about this, though remember a year ago, he did set up the Space Force as the fifth branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Well, we did ask the White House, the Department of Defense, and Israeli officials to comment. So far, they have not responded to the NBC News request, and I wonder if they ever will. And the doors were open. Naturally, I was curious, and, you know, I just happened to look in. And that's when I saw some debris or it looked like parts of a plane or something that they hadn't had a crash. Because I've seen them do this a lot of times, bring in pieces and the old ambulances in. Can you describe the debris? Yeah, they were... I noticed in two of the ambulances there was some debris that was probably two and a half to three feet you know, long and probably high that was propped up on the side of the ambulance there. They were kind of in the shape of maybe like a half a canoe. They they were uh, like the front part of a canoe. And, uh, you know, it looked like it, looked like it might be aluminum, but it, it looked more like it was, the metal looked more like stainless steel that had been heated. It was blue, kind of a bluish tint to it. What was odd about it, it looked like around the curved part in the front of the canoe, there was some there was some uh, designs or something that kind of reminded me of maybe some Egyptian signs or whatever. Well, we, you know, both ordered, I'm not sure, remember what we ordered, but it was just a light, just a light lunch. But she was so upset, uh, she looked like she was, you know, in shock is what she really talked like and looked like. And uh, she said, I want to, she said, I said, well, I was just curious on the reason I want to talk to you. I was curious on what happened. And she said, well, you won't believe it. And she says, I don't believe it either. But she said, uh, I got in a lot of trouble on this thing. I probably, I'm not real sure about this. But she said, when I, then she pulled out of a, a little purse or a little pocketbook, whatever she had there. She gave me a little diagram that she had that she had drawn some dry, some uh, figures of uh, of some arms and a uh, face and so on. She told me that this is what you know was what was in those uh, that it was a crash, it wasn't an airplane, but they didn't know what it was at that time. These were bodies. Yeah, but she said we have three bodies. That there was three bodies. She said two of them were very mutilated. One looked like it might have walked out or that it, you know, might have lived a, a little while. 
and she explained they were like three and a half feet to four feet tall. The uh, two of the bodies were the, the you couldn't identify much because they were practically destroyed, and it looked like maybe that they might have been uh, a predatory animal or something might have uh, been doing some damage on the bodies too. How did she describe her head, her hands? Well, she said the head. And, in the, the little drawings that I had, she, the way she explained it and the way she drew it, that the heads were somewhat larger than, than a human heads. The hands were long, no thumbs. It was just the long, very delicate fingers at the end of the, on the underside at the tip of each finger was a pad-like, uh, maybe a little pad, but it looked like the skin had maybe little suction, like the little suction cups on those. On the uh, no fingernails on the hands, the head, the lips were very just a long, narrow, more or less uh, not full lips like we would have in a, in most of our people, but very fine line, very fine lips. Uh, there was no teeth. It was the inside of the mouth. It was it was kind of like a real. Uh, the gums, or maybe it was, uh, she said, explain it, it was almost as hard as if it was rawhide, maybe, at that. The uh, the ears, there was only two small orifices on each side of the head with, uh, looked like a couple of small lobes that might, some way that might cover both of those, but there was not a protruding ear. And also that the nose, there was only two small orifices in the nose it was there was really no nose that was uh, convex it was all just uh, flush with the uh, the face was she emotional about all this? very much so very emotional she would have to stop and drink water every once in a while and uh, also uh she never touched a meal at all the time we were talking in the an hour and a half that we were there. She never touched a meal. Any other demonstrations of emotion? Indications of how she was upset? Well, just, you know, every once in a while she'd go like this, you know, and wringing her hands, and she said it was the most, most, uh, hor I've never been so horrified in my life. I've never seen anything so gruesome in my life. I've never smelt anything that smelt worse in my life. And she told me that when I saw her, she was leaving the room to go to the bathroom because she was deathly ill and was going to throw up. Well, yeah, we'd visited a while, and then I had to get back to the funeral home and go back to work, but uh, then uh, I never did see her after that. And I called out the next day to see how she was feeling, see what... And they told me that she wasn't available. Then I wouldn't be available that day. I called the next day, and they told me that she'd been transferred. And it was rather odd because she'd only been at the base less than three months. That was her on commission less than three months, and that was her first assignment. So it was rather odd that she would be transferred out, you know, within three months. Then about two weeks, probably two weeks, at least two weeks, could have been a little longer, but I know it was at least two weeks. I got a, I got a letter addressed to me at Glenn Dennis at the Ballard Field Home. With uh, she didn't sign, it didn't have any returned address or anything on it. But inside of the letter, it was just a note. She said, "I don't have time to write. I will write later. This is my APO number," and that was that was the extent of it. So then I wrote back to her and uh, asked her more or less how, you know, how she was feeling and why the sudden transfer, and then I was hoped that she wasn't in any trouble. It was just a short note. I really didn't go into a lot of detail or anything. Then probably three weeks or probably a month after that, then I got the letter that I had mailed to her. It was return. It was stamped return. And also, it's on the on the, in red printing. It said deceased, and that's the last time I ever heard or heard anything about it. Very good time to leave because I'm going to say something horrible. Um, 
Well, the main thing I want to say is perhaps human civilization is coming to an end. Uh, I said perhaps. Uh, there's nothing certain, really, in this area. Um, that's the gist of what I'm talking, what I'm going to talk this evening. Um, let me start with uh, talking about Dr. James, David Jacobs, who is an abduction researcher in the United States. He made two arguments, very important arguments, in relation to alien abduction. The first one is the primary purpose of abduction is to produce hybrids, human-alien hybrids. And the second one is the primary purpose of this hybrid project is to colonize the Earth. He bases the second argument on two observations. The first one is the mass production of the second uh, generation hybrids. Aliens produce hybrids not only between themselves and humans, but also between these alien human hybrids and humans. Uh, humans. I can't move. You can't move. You don't have any control over what's happening. Under separate hypnosis, Dan's wife, Joyce, recalled the same sequence of events. They both say little beings marched them outside. Together, the family was floated onto a spaceship. I never wanted it to happen to my children. I didn't realize until later that it had. But when they took her, I couldn't do anything. Heather. Now 22 and married, remembers a series of abductions beginning in childhood when she was forced to play telepathic games with the aliens. How do you play the game? If I pick up that one, he'll let me go. Does he tell you about that? If I pick it up, he'll let me go. The Aaron's family believes alien kidnappers have not only intruded in the lives of their children, but are now visiting one of their grandchildren. He calls them his little buddies that come in his room and play. He said he wanted to watch the ship leave. I'm not going to tell him that it's not real because it is real. Skeptics would say that Dan, Joyce, and Heather could have constructed their stories together before hypnosis. But then they'd have to know how to answer the trick questions and the leading suggestions which I provide. Plus, there are many details they wouldn't know about that we would be looking for as markers for truthfulness and reliability with other abduction data. Help me welcome Paul Christopher. There are three primary movements involved in a satanic strategy with the sole purpose of implementing a divine plan to bring about a one world order and a new world religion, simultaneously ushering in the emergence of an Aquarian Age Christ. Now, the first of these primary movements is the occult, or the practice of the occult sciences. And the occult has been with us since God created Adam and Eve, since Lucifer and one-third of God's angels were cast out of heaven. And God forbids us to dabble in the occult in Deuteronomy 18 because this leads to this doorway into the demonic realm. So, now as a direct result of this occult revival and also this contact with these supposed ETs, 
over the past 50 years, a new religious movement has emerged, known as the New Age Movement. And an integral part of this New Age Movement is the undertaking of this spiritual assignment, known as the Divine Plan. The spiritual reorganization of the planet, that's what they're attempting to, to, um, to do. Now, as we can see, in all likelihood, this extraterrestrial appearance is a costume. It's a smoke screen. But thousands of people are being deceived. Now, as Christians, we can recognize this smoke screen because the Bible tells us. Beware of the wiles of the devil. Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. And his demons can be ministers of righteousness. We know that. But a lot of people are being deceived. They're being deceived because they've been conditioned to think that these craft and these entities are benevolent or extraterrestrial. And in fact, over the years, through the contacts, they claim they will save the planet when these cataclysmic changes will come upon the earth. Many feel they will be rescued and taken to another planet. But lately, they appear to be waiting for something, for some moment in time. And we saw Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, hit the markets. And Strieber claimed that he was abducted by these alien creatures. And bizarre things happened to him. Sinister sinister experience. He even admits in his book that he believed these beings were demons or could have been demons. He also admitted that before writing this book, he delved into the occult. He studied Buddhism, mysticism, witchcraft. So he was set up for this thing to take place in his life because he was already involved in occult activities. But after this book came out, and this actually renewed the public's interest in the UFO phenomenon at this time. But other claims of alien abductions emerged. Thousands of people claimed that they were having similar experiences with abductions being taken against their will into spaceships. Weird things were going on, medical experiments sexual activity they often claim that a light would come through their bedroom window and they would see figures in this light and oftentimes they claim that they saw animals in this light wolves monkeys owls even Whitley Streeper claimed that he saw an owl in this light. Others reported seeing angels or devils in this light. Then these animals or spiritual beings turned into these gray humanoid alien beings. Now, interestingly, if you study the Middle Ages, the practice of demonology was prevalent during this time. In fact, ancient families regularly practiced magic with the intention of conjuring these demons. In fact, these ancient families, in all likelihood, are the ones involved in these occult secret societies, the Freemasons, the Illuminati. And oftentimes, or what occurred when they conjured these demons is they attach these demons to their children. So demonology became generational, and it always has been generational. But we can see evidence of this during the Middle Ages. Members of the same family are inhabited by demons for generations. This is what went on. These demons even had distinct names. 
and they manifest it into different physical forms. And this list of so, is some is some of the forms that they manifested into. And you can see they appeared as angels or spiritual beings. They appeared as humans. They appeared as animals. They appeared as birds. They appeared as all sorts of creatures with claws and fangs even. So they could take on any... I am Clark C. McClellan, former SCO spacecraft operator at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and Cape Canaveral. I was there from 1958 to 1992, a lot of years. While I was there, and I'm still counting the missions, I have witnessed and I have helped launch 881 missions so far. I may hold the record for that as an individual from those two bases. While I was at the Kennedy Space Center, I was the unit director for the National Investigations Committee of Aerial Phenomena in Washington, D.C. Major Donald Kehoe was my director. He assigned me to that position at the Cape and at KSC. I interviewed and talked with many astronauts about their UFO experiences and alien contacts. When I was there... On one of my mission assignments, I observed an eight to nine foot tall entity. I will not call it an alien because I can't prove that. But eight to nine foot tall anything inside the space shuttle that was built for only people six foot or under is something to question. I did see an alien craft hovering behind the space shuttle uh, ohms pods. That's the area of their main engines in the rear. My friend in California who has passed away now contacted me and told me that he had another person that observed an eight to nine foot tall entity during another mission of a space shuttle. It was in the crew compartment. The crew compartment? Yes. I talked to this witness. He said that the entity was hunching over, bending over in order to not hit its head on the uh, ceiling. And I thought, my God, two such cases like this, how can anyone hide it? He said, I don't know. I'm protecting him in his name because I don't want him to lose his retirement like I did. Should we be worried about this? Well, we, we are concerned about it. As the ranking member of terrorism and counterintelligence, we have questions. Uh, it comes down to some of the new infrared radar systems that we're putting on some of our new jets are detecting some things out there. We call them unidentified uh, aerial threats, and that's something, th something that we're looking at. Our UAPs is what we call it. We want to know the information, and that's why it's important that we take a look at this. So this has been going on an awfully long time. There's a lot of data the government have, has stored about this. Most of it, I think, is still classified. But there must be theories about what these objects are, what these aircraft are. What's the most plausible theory, do you think? Well, what we don't know for sure, obviously. What we do know uh, is the question that we're wanting to get to is, is this something that's a defense mechanism from another country? We do know that China is looking right. at hypersonic missiles. Uh, that's 25,000 kilometers, or to break it down into our language, that's getting from D.C., where I'm at, to L.A. in about nine minutes. Uh, we don't know that the nuclear warheads can be attached to those. Is it something like that, uh, or is it something more? We, we don't know, but I feel like it, it, it's something that we must take a look Get, and that's why we've written Secretary Spencer of the Navy. Is there any indication that you're aware of that these sightings are foreign aircraft, Russian or Chinese aircraft? Uh, we, we don't know. Uh, what, we have no evidence to support that. We do know there's something that's traveling at that speed of what we call hypersonic now, which is a Mach 4 or 5, not to right. get too technical. Uh, that is something that we want to know. Is this something that, uh, that another defense system uh, in another country is more advanced, or is it something else? We're not trying to spook people out. But the, AA, the AATIP, uh, which is basically a program that the government monitors this, was to close down in 2017. So part of my question, Tucker, is it really closed down? Are we sp still spending resources, or is there more documentation that this program is still being able to file somewhere? That's, that's something that we need to know, even if it's just for defense purposes alone. 
We spoke to a government employee who has worked on this issue who said that the U.S. government has wreckage from one of these aircraft. Do you know anything about that? Uh, we don't know, but that's one of the four questions that we are asking. Is there evidence being held somewhere? Not to get too spooky once again, but if there is evidence, right. I believe it's important for people, specifically in my position as the ranking member of terrorism and counterintelligence, we need to know what this is. The initial encounters, I was in my barracks at, in May of 1965, and at night the American generals with three and four stars would come through with their alien counterparts, their alien generals, because the tall white society is structured very similar to ours. And, and, and when they came through, you know, I, I thought I was nuts. <laughs> I thought I was dreaming, you know. When I was sent to Indian Springs, I was never given a briefing. No one ever came to me and said, this is what you're facing. No one ever came to me and said, you're part of a project and had me sign a piece of paper. No one ever came to me and said, um, the aliens would like to tell you something. The aliens never wanted to tell me anything. They were perfectly fine. Perf I was an enlisted man. It was perfectly f fine with everybody if I was never told. I, I, everything I knew, I had to figure out for myself and um, by reasoning and by observing and so on. As a weather observer, I was never part of a specific project. I was never helping design an airplane. However, you'll see in book three, in the appendix, as a, since I have a master's degree in physics, I have published Hall Photon Theory. I believe I understand the physics of how their craft works, and we'll get to that in a later slide. <clears throat> but meeting them was a very emotional experience. They are naturally as afraid of us as we are of them. Some nights after I got used to the idea that they were real and that they would come around with the men, women, and children, because they have men, women, and children just as we do, and, and I got, once I got used to that, uh, then, then it was kind of their turn to be afraid. I remember one night, in, there were many nights, but one night, for example, after the, the deep space had arrived on, at sundown on the night of the full moon, as usual, and this was about oh, August 1966 in there, and the tall white guards who were experienced had brought a group of new arrivals down to show them me, what a human looks like. And, I, I know I'm the test human. I'm an enlisted man. If anything goes wrong, they can just cut me down, and we haven't missed anything, you know. And the new arrivals have to get used to talking to a human before they can in, be introduced to quality folk like generals and scientists, you know. So take them out, and if anything goes wrong, well, we'll just cut down Charlie, you know. But nobody's told me that. But I remember it was almost comical because some of them were so afraid of me that they wouldn't come within a quarter mile. They were out in the j j desert, you know, like, you know, did you see the gorilla? You know, yeah, I saw the gorilla. I'm just out there trying to do my job, right, you know? <clears throat> they have a very dry sense of humor. Uh, when you get to know them, they don't have contact sports like we do because they don't have the bodies for it. If they break an arm, it takes their arm ten times longer to heal up than it does ours. If they scratch themselves, it takes their scratch ten times longer to heal up than it does you and I. One day I was out there in the morning and I scratched myself, and I was young and in the most perfectly ordinary fashion. I put on some alcohol and forgot about it. And the next day when they came, the scratch had already healed up. And, and one of the new arrivals, who was braver than the other, was talking to the guard, and they noted that my scratch had already healed up and asked if all humans were that way. It seemed to be a, one of the few things that humans did that they found envious. Seeing, like, all Draw a movies. small gray. Small gray. Yeah. That's not Are small these gray. the aliens that you've seen? That is not gray. No, but... Which ones do you see? Yeah, these right here. The small gray. They have a little they had a mouth. mouth. How do they, they breathe? They, they have nostrils, but they don't... Um, do they breathe oxygen? Yes, they can breathe oxygen. They, they, um, the atmosphere on their planet is very similar, but it's a binary star system, so they have, like, two suns, and which makes the air a lot drier. Their skin is very... Their bones are more fragile than ours. But, um, they kind of... So I can fucking... They kind of look like that. They don't fuck What's their body look like? The one, well, was a female. She, she actually Draw the died. other one. This is the gray. Draw, the other. Draw all three of them. Do the girls have Because I don't know what you want to do. What are the reptile ones look like? And then there's and we, another one, which is actually a clone. Like, uh, these things created a clone, which looks something similar, but it has a lot of... They cloned? 
They have large pointy noses, but they they but pretty much. You <laughs> <laughs> said they live among us. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> there was another incident uh, called the. <laughs> And these right here are the tall whites, and yeah. they're actually a clone uh, created by the small grays. To, to, to are they Jewish? white servants? What's so the, the angry? Jewish. What's the angry ones look like? The, the reptile ones that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, the fucking bad. The ones that we're gonna be fighting. Yeah, they have they have small. Yeah, we eyes. actually saw those in uh, Battle LA. Um. They had small eyes, and, uh, and they cut open their stomachs and found They got weapons? They, so they have weapons. They're kind of like an onion. Um, Do they have weapons? They have layers. But it's okay, she's a veterinarian. Are, they, help. are they evil? Are, are the, alien, the alien ones? Or not? They look like reptiles, not friendly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This is a very bad drawing. But, um... The, it's bad. This is pretty good to me. <laughs> this is dudes on land we lost, right? Just eat some food. How tall are those motherfuckers right there? These guys right here, yeah. and they have, they're all humanoids, so they both walk on two legs, they all walk on two legs. Well, I don't want to fuck that thing. And this thing right here, <laughs> the first thing, and they'll go like the fucking first one I've talked about. This thing, <laughs> this thing right here is huge. They're, they're actually, uh, they're taller than oh. us. They're, they stand about six feet. Foot, something on an average to seven foot. Are they well, like, are they like 230? Like, they're huge. Like, I don't know, but the, the, the one image right that now? I have seen of them, they're huge, like, they have a uh, very strong build. Like, uh, fuck But it. their bones are fragile. No, not those. Dude, this is going those on small, American small Zombies. Small. Well, what's up with the fucking big well, bees? Like, what's their fucking planet like? Yeah. Like this guy? Yeah. Like I don't know, but they... Know. How do they react? Can they breathe oxygen too? Bees, yes. But these and these had a, a big, a large war. Okay, who won? Um, these guys, well, no, these guys won. They almost wiped these out, but they had a soft spot. So we should be more worried about their the was destroyed, so they had to go to the Serpo. Well, this guy's got a fucking bunch of motherfucking clones. So How do you know that there was an alien war? Because EBE one said so. I actually watched Star Wars. What the fuck is EBE one? <laughs> it's the Ford. We exchanged it's the, the motherfucking. It's we did like surviving. a Ford exchange program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, EBE we exchanged some aliens for some fucking aliens. <laughs> they took us back to their fucking planet. They took they twelve of us. You. <laughs> if you if you go online and look at under the majestic twelve and and actually oh so President uh, who was it? Told Steven Steven Spielberg. When, when that movie was made, uh, in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the president told Steven Spielberg that he hit the nail on the head. And pretty much. Because uh, okay. at the end of the movie, you can count them. They send are these 12 motherfuckers, humans in, when, when this asteroid or whatever the fuck is going to go on here pretty soon, are these motherfuckers going to come help us out, or what are they going to do? Uh, well... Nope, this asteroid's supposed to be around a wrecking spaceship. 2012. 2012. December 21st, 2012. The asteroid, that fucking... The, 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 okay, there, there was Are an asteroid. Are those motherfuckers going to come help us out? Maybe Jesus okay, was an alien. You know what? They said that that's a very strong possibility. <laughs> Some That he wasn't an alien, but he was... Our DNA has been altered 60, 68 times since uh, since uh, the caveman days. Okay. So, so, do you I believe in Je Do you not believe in Jesus? Come help us out. I do. I do. do you believe I he was an alien? I don't know if I need to send I'm, money or if I need to spend my what money. Kind of what do I do? I just go out. Do I buy stocks or sell stocks? Because if not, then I'll fucking fun. blow all my money and shit and have a good fucking time. Okay, well, everybody. the the thing that they're calling <laughs> a, an asteroid that's supposed to hit us and yeah. destroy us was actually uh, not an asteroid. It's a spaceship. Holy shit, we're done. It, it's, it is. Uh, it was actually this, a spaceship of the reptilian kind, but it's since then... So we're going to get invaded. No, that's what they were talking about. It's going to be a raid. But this check is it out. where this all ties that's into right. the military. All right, man. We <laughs> Yeah, we have the Avengers. Yeah. Thank God. No, it hey, where are these <laughs> motherfuckers at? Because if these, these motherfuckers are like within a couple years out... These motherfuckers are nowhere to be seen. What the fuck's going on? Well, that's what we're doing. We're forming an alliance with them. We, we've actually God. sent 12 yeah, of our own right. to their planet, and they stayed there for 13 years. How did we get our guys to this Obama planet? Obama? supposed to be... Set. I'm pretty sure he knows. I'm, I'm pretty sure all the presidents know something about it. 
Ever wonder what might lie out there deep in space? Do you want to believe we're not alone, that somewhere in the universe, intelligent life may actually exist? Our next guest says there is life out there. It does exist. Dr. Charles Halls says he spent two years working with extraterrestrial beings during his time with the American military. He claims the US military has actually been in contact with alien species for years. And Dr. Charles Hall is here to explain, along with his wife Marie, live from what Bugs Bunny used to call Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, thank you both for your time. <laughs> Terrific to have you with us. Firstly, Charles, can you tell us your story of how you managed to come into contact with these beings as you worked with the military? I'm a Vietnam veteran and I enlisted in the Air Force in July 1964 and I was trained as a weather observer and I was sent to Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, outside Las Vegas, Nevada. And I, for two and a half years I was sent up to the gunnery ranges up at Indian Springs and I was given a clearance to allow me to go anywhere anywhere in dreamland uh, as long as I was alone. I discovered that up there at the north end of Indian Springs Valley, which you can see on the map in the state of Nevada here in America, that there was a base which the U.S. Air Force maintained mm -hmm. for a group of extraterrestrials who were tall and white. And I, as the duty weather observer, was allowed to go up there or they were allowed to come down to where I was. And that the interaction took place over more than two years. Wow. During those two years, I also came across, I, I also interacted to a lesser extent with the Roswell Grays, and I've also personally talked with the extraterrestrials that I call the Norwegians with 24 teeth, who come here from a very nearby star, perhaps Bernard star. And um, my experiences, my presentations, my books are unique mm -hmm. because um, I'm the only person that I know that I know of that was allowed to interact with the extraterrestrials, the tall whites, for more than two years. So three different species of, of aliens you're talking about there, Charles. Yeah, can you describe what they looked yes, like, what, what they were like? Well, I'll, I'll start with the tall whites. They're <coughs> thinner than we are, and they're very frail. Throughout most of their life, they are the same height as I am, 5'11", but they, and they live 10 times longer than humans. They live 600 or 800 years. Wow. And, but they don't age the way we do. When they, when they get to be equivalent to a human of about 40 years, that means when they are about 400 years, they start growing again instead of aging as humans. Right. And then they go, and this continues, and so that by the time they get to be 600 or 800 years old, they're very tall, eight and a half, nine, or ten feet tall, but this is not necessarily good because their skeleton grows more than their internal organs. Uh. And so there comes a time after six or eight hundred years when their skeleton, their body is tall, but their organs can't support can't it, support the at organism. which time they mm. die a natural death because they're just flesh and blood creatures like we are. If they injure themselves, it takes them ten times longer to heal up than a human. Yeah. So there's a trade-off. Yeah, right. They still look fresh as a daisy when they go, though. They, they mm. look like Tilda Swinton. Hey, um, just yeah. quickly, mm. you, you, you had them there. You were working with the aliens um, for on, on any particular project, or was the military working with the aliens on a particular project? Was there, I don't know, technology <laughs> sharing or, you know, botanical cross-fertilisation? The... Um, the U.S. Air Force, and I'm speaking of the mid-1960s, w was willing to give them anything they asked for. When I first met them, I was very afraid of them, and every human I met when you come across them out in the desert was naturally very afraid of them, and they were even more afraid of us. It's like running into a gorilla in the wild where the gorilla is on his home ground. So they had to go through a process of becoming used to being around humans before they could take part in the technology transfer program. I, as the weather observer, was the 
to test human. I, as an enlisted man, I was expendable. You know, sure. I was the yeah. one they send out to say, the yeah. just talking exactly. to Charlie. And Marie, let's bring you in. Mm -hmm. You've never yeah. seen these things for yourself. Are you a believer? Because probably a lot of people watching this this morning are going to think, I don't believe him. It's ridiculous. How could it be possible? Uh, well. Charles was very intelligent in that he waited until we'd been married a couple of months before he told me about <laughs> the extraterrestrials coming into his barracks at night. And uh, he said, well, what do you think? And I said, I really don't care. I have never given any thought as to whether they uh, exist or not, and I really don't care. I've known Charles. We, we've been married over 43 years. Uh, he may be a character, but I am his character reference, <laughs> and uh, I, I totally, <laughs> I totally believe uh, that this is real. Furthermore, we have had uh, confirmations from people all over the world. We have never had any serious. Uh, Tire kickers, you yeah, know, people yeah. who say, "Well, well, uh, certainly there seems to be a lot of people. Would seem to be a lot of people around the world who would support your view on this. Who seem to have had their own experiences, but probably not quite as intimately as you." <sighs> people have developed technologies which allow us to throw off our physical forms and travel great distances in the blink of an eye. We are in dialogue with your leaders to help the human race survive its infancy, for we believe in you. We are helping your scientists find cures for diseases which afflict your bodies and helping you to preserve your planet's most precious resources. Many among us wage peace, and one day, with our help, war may be a thing of the past. Our army is a billion strong and growing. Together, we are shaping the future of humankind. Before we start into this, I must give you a warning. Whenever I share this talk, I share this warning. It's important. The following information may change your preconceived notions of the alien abduction experience. The following is an excerpt taken directly from the transcript of Mr. D's interview. I thought I was having a satanic experience, that the devil had gotten a hold of me and had shoved a pole up my rectum and was holding me up in the air. So helpless, I couldn't do anything. I said, Jesus, Jesus, help me, or Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When I did, there was a feeling or a sound or something that either my words that I had thought or the words that I had tried to say or whatever had hurt whatever was holding me up in the air on this pole. And I felt like it was withdrawn and I fell. I hit the bed because it was like I was thrown back in the bed. I really can't tell, but when I did, my wife woke up and asked why I was jumping on the bed. Typical type of experience, I hear this many times, you know, same scenarios. In all the research we had done, we had never heard of a case of anybody stopping an experience. All the researchers, the top researchers, were saying that this could not be done. You couldn't stop an abduction experience. They had no record of it. So here I am with a case where a guy says he called out in the name of Jesus and stopped an experience. Was this one case unusual? But I knew I had something powerful. When God showed me to go back and look at this video, I knew this was something unique. And if I could confirm that it wasn't just unique in that one case, then this could be absolutely huge in the UFO community. I contacted these top researchers in the country. I said, guys, I've got a case here. I don't know what to make of it. I shared them the case. Each time I did, they asked, can we go off the record? And I said, sure. I can't tell you their names, but I can tell you what they said. Each one of them said, yes, sir, we've come across cases like this ourselves, where they've been able to stop it using prayer or Jesus' name. I said, excuse me, how come we have never seen this documented? 
You're telling us otherwise, that it can't be done, it can't be stopped. First answer they usually gave us, we didn't know what to make of it. I would have been fine with that. The second answer is what puzzled me and got me kind of angry. They, because it was that one that I want you to hear for sure. They said, we couldn't go there because it might affect our credibility in the realm. My name, as I said, was Paul Hellyer. I'm a former Minister of National Defense for Canada. I served in three governments during a total of 23 and a half years as a member of Parliament. Although I was Minister of National Defense, um, I had sighting reports uh, of UFOs. Uh, I was too busy to be concerned about them at the time because I was trying to unify the Army, Navy, and Air Force into a single Canadian Defense Force, and that itself was a kind of uh, battle to the finish. So um, this was not high on my agenda. But it, about 10 years ago, I started getting interested uh, due to a young man from Ottawa sending me material on the subject. I told him I was too busy to read it, but he had confidence that someday I would. He sent me a copy of um, Colonel Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. It took me a while to get around to reading it, but I took it uh, for my summer reading in 2005 and um, was really impressed with what was contained in it. And what I thought to myself is there are huge issues here, huge issues. And the American people and the people of the world have a right to know what's going on because they're part of it. It's not just an isolated thing. And so after confirming the contents of the book with a retired uh, United States Air Force general, I accept the invitation of Victor Vigiani, uh, who's over here somewhere, and his uh, cohort, uh, Mike Bird, to speak to a symposium at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. That gave me the dubious distinction of being the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of company, countries uh, to say so unequivocally. <laughs> Since then, I've learned a lot from many sources, including a number of the fantastic witnesses that we have heard these last four days. So they were so outstanding, I was just really blown away with them, uh, the amount of information that was available. And I appreciate uh, every single one of them. But because I'm not a ufologist, um, I'm a politician, there are only a few things that I want to add in that particular realm. <clears throat> First is that about um, in the 1960s sometime, there was a flotilla of UFOs headed south that crossed into NATO territory in Europe, and um, the commander-in-chief of uh, the Supreme Allied, Allied uh, Headquarters in Europe, uh, was naturally very shaken. Uh, fortunately, or maybe divine providence, before um, the panic button was pushed, the flotilla turned around and headed back north. Uh, obviously, they had thought maybe they were Russian and they were very concerned about it. Anyway, a, uh, <clears throat> an investigation was launched into this whole subject, and uh, a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. And this is my own uh, view at this stage as well. So, except for that, there are just a couple of um, things that we've talked about that I'd like to refer to. And one was that we've we're referring to them as they until this morning when Linda Moulton Howe, I think she was the first one, actually named three different species. I have brought my uh, latest book uh, called Light at the End of the Tunnel, a survival plan for the human species as an aid memoir, and uh, I name five different uh, species here. I'm aware of uh, more now 
As a matter of fact, I saw a document uh, just a few days ago that mentioned 20. Uh, and I think you, Mr. Chairman, were interested in some of the places they might come from. And I have in here Zeta Reticuli, R-E-T-I-C-U-L-I, Reticuli, the Pleiades, Orion, and Romita, and the Altair star systems. So uh, I don't think we can any more refer them to them as they because they're not an amorphous mass. They are different species and consequently may have different agendas. I don't think we can say that they all have the ag same agenda any more than we could say that the United States, uh, China, and, uh, and Russia had the same agenda agenda. Our real interests may be very similar, but as of now, our perceived interests are still uh, quite far apart. One more observation before I begin what I want to say, and that is that we spent quite a bit of time talking about the 66-year-old cadavers, and I was glad to have Linda this morning finally say that there are live ETs on Earth at this present time. And um, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. Is this manifestation of orbs and craft and, and other phenomena, other anomalies. Meanwhile, shows like the History Channel's Ancient Aliens yes. program is promulgating what I call the coming great deception. They're saying that E.T. created all life on this planet, that they genetically manipulated all life on this planet, that they started the world civilizations and religions and now are coming back at this critical juncture in human history. And then, of course their plans to create a mock alien invasion. I have uh, talked briefly on the radio for Prophecy Club about the flying saucers, somebody very high up in the New World Order who was brought to Christ by a close friend of mine has talked about piloting the flying saucers. Yes, the United States government has flying saucers. He considered that the beings that were co-piloting these flying saucers were aliens. And he took a second look and realized these were demons. I could go on. The bottom line is, is I have concluded that there are no good aliens. The aliens are demons. And we've got um, a, a mixture going on of demons and, and flesh and blood. And we've also got other genetic experiments. Fresh pickings from the political grapevine. Our top story today was Iran taunting the U.S. over the sanctions negotiations. Now an Iranian news agency is making some other accusations about the U.S., and they're interesting. The Washington Post writes, FARS, which describes itself as Iran's leading independent news agency, claims documents leaked by Edward Snowden provide, quote, incontrovertible proof that an alien or extraterrestrial intelligence agenda is driving U.S. domestic and international policy. The more we study the evidence that is being assembled all over the earth, the more inescapable the conclusion that man had best prepare himself for the greatest event in human history. During our first mission to the moon, Mission Control recorded the following broadcast of strange noises that were heard on the Apollo 11 spacecraft. This is Apollo Control. Still no explanation. The weird noises emanating from uh, Apollo 11, if indeed it is. In his book, Secrets of the UFOs, UFOlogist Don Elkins made the following observation. I have found that some people can achieve the contact phenomenon simply by being hypnotized, and the same general message permeates over 90% of the millions of words received by thousands of people around the world. I believe that it's demonic. I think all of the evidence indicates this. Some people claim that by allowing themselves to be put into an hypnotic trance, they are acting as a channeling device in which the extraterrestrial being speaks through them. The following is an actual sampling of those messages. 
We come from the Interplanetary Confederation of Solar Systems, and our purpose is to aid our brother man on the planet Earth as the new age dawns. The teacher that was known to you as Jesus was able to use many more of the abilities than the people of this planet. Unfortunately, man upon planet Earth has misinterpreted the meaning of this man's life. He was no different from any of you. He was simply able to remember certain principles. These principles may be realized by anyone at any time. It is only necessary that you avail yourself to our contact through meditation in order to begin to re-realize that which is rightfully yours. UFO researcher John Weldon then offers this question. How credible is it to think that literally thousands of genuine extraterrestrials would fly millions of light years simply to teach New Age philosophy, deny Christianity, and support the occult? And why would the entities actually possess and inhabit people just like demons do? if they were really advanced extraterrestrials. Dr. Pierre Guerin, an eminent scientist associated with the French National Council for Scientific Research, concludes that UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it, and that modern UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. You can literally hypnotize a person, tell them that there's a cat in their lap, they will see it, they will hear it, purr, they will pet it and feel it. It's not physically there. You tell the cat to scratch them, you know, and bring them out of it, there are scratch marks on their cheek. A non-physical object under the right conditions can leave physical evidence. Uh, I think it's demonic. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a spiritual power of some kind for which there is no physical explanation. It, the, you can't explain it with the laws of chemistry and physics as we know it. In 1969, the United States Printing Office issued a 400-page publication entitled UFOs and Related Subjects, an Annotated Bibliography. The author was the senior bibliographer for the Library of Congress, Ms. Lynn E. Coteau. During her research, she read over 1,000 articles, books, and other literature. She summarizes her findings in the preface of the bibliography. A large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist manifestations and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomenon that have long been known to theologians and parapsychologists. This document was compiled for the United States Air Force and is now in the Library of Congress. Dr. Jacques Vallée has addressed the United Nations on UFOs and was the model for Lacombe in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He is the author of eight books on UFOs and has been widely recognized as the premier investigating scientist in the realm of UFO research. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Vallée says, an impressive parallel can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons. And in his book, Confrontations, he writes, The medical examinations to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. He also made this statement, I believe that when we speak of UFO sightings as instances of space visitations, we are looking at the phenomenon on the wrong level. We are not dealing with successive waves of visitations from space. We are dealing with a control system. And he states, UFOs are the means through which man's concepts are being rearranged. They are engaging in a worldwide enterprise of subliminal seduction. Jacques Vallée, is, at least at that time when he wrote that book, was an agnostic. Interesting that he comes to basically the same conclusions I do as a Christian from my research. And he said uh, about UFOs, they're real, but they're not physical. 
They're messengers of deception. And this was based on his research of about 20 years. They seem to be psychologically preparing, setting us up for some ultimate delusion that is too horrible even to imagine as yet. I would agree with that. At least 40 cities around the world now have these vessels hovering over them. London, okay, the picture is breaking up, but you can see a craft there. This is a momentous day. We're delighted to meet you. But we need your help. We're far from home. Et nous avons besoin d'eau et de minéraux pour survivre. Ces éléments sont facilement disponibles et abondants sur la Terre. Em troca, nós estamos prontos a divulgar nossa tecnologia avançada com vocês. A tecnologia é Leti Tussad. Ela é Israel, Hayetiko, Picol e Megalan. After we've replenished ourselves and shared with you what we can, we will leave you, hopefully better than we found you. We look forward to getting to know our new friends. There will be more communication with your world's leaders in the hours to come. Until then, we are of peace. We're one united people. Here. This is what I always hoped it would be. They're watching us all the time. They're controlling the way we think. He said that they're here to help us. The Earth has a new destiny. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Allah. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Welcome to the golden age of man. We're one united people. They inspired us to rise from the ashes as one people of one world world to see no armed conflict. Nations have put their petty differences aside 
United, we rebuilt our families, our cities, and their lives. The fusion of human and alien technology not only enabled us to defy gravity and travel with unimaginable speed, it also made our planet finally safe again. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. He said, it's like when you go to heaven that your mind is transformed and you instantly have the mind of Jesus. You instantly have powers and you have abilities and things. He said, well, then I asked the rock and roll dude. He said, Jesus, but he said the rock and roll dude. He said, then I asked him, um, what's going to happen, you know, with my mom and my brother and everything. He said he was shown the future. He said he was shown that there was going to be a World War Three that was going to take place on the earth. He said, Mom, he said, people think they are going to have to worry about World War Three. He said, that's not what people have to worry about, Mom. He said, there's something bad and evil coming. And I said, oh, really? I said, what's that? And he said, it's the war of the demons, the war of the alien demons. That's what he called them. He's called them alien demons. He said that there were these creatures, these demon alien type creatures. And he said they were evil and they were part of Satan's army and that Satan was going to wage war upon this world and try to destroy everyone here. And he said, World War III is going to be bad. He said, but it's nothing, nothing compared to the war that is coming from the alien demonic beings. He said they were going to come to Earth and try to destroy it, and they were going to eat people. This is what he told me. He said they were going to eat people, these demon, demon alien things. And as you know, there are no aliens. They are going to portray themselves as aliens, but they're demons. More documents reveal some pretty strange behavior from a popular Bay Area death metal guitarist just before his house went up in flames. News Channel 8's Victoria Price has this new information for us tonight. She is in our Tampa newsroom. Well, Keith, it turns out that after that fire, investigators sifted through all the damage to find a huge stockpile of weapons. Oh, that's it, it was crazy. pop, 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 pop. That's how a neighbor described the scene as Pat O'Brien's Northdale home went up in flames last week. O'Brien is the lead guitarist for Cannibal Corpse, a popular Tampa-based death metal band. On December 10th, firefighters showed up to find ammunition exploding inside the home. Meanwhile, investigators say O'Brien broke into a house a few doors down, refused to leave, and told his neighbors the rapture is coming. Court documents show O'Brien also made strange phone calls to his parents earlier that day, telling them, quote, the aliens have landed. 